Okay, welcome to our discussion of the folk theorem. So, if you are following along in the notes, we are at the bottom of page 22. Yes, we skipped, or we're going to skip some discussion of average payoffs. Uh, that's okay. It's not in the problem set. Uh, it won't be on the exam. So last time, we looked at this game between Yuk and Zuk, this escalation of conflict game. We said, let G represent this game. It's still going to represent this game. And so last time, we wrote down grim trigger strategies, and we found a critical delta so that the path of play in subgame perfect Nash equilibrium is that both players de-escalate in every period. The result being that in every period, both players get two. Yuk gets two. Zook gets two, it's discounted as time goes on, but both of them get two. So now we want to ask ourselves, not specifically about a path, a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium path of play in which both players de-escalate in every period but ra and both receive two, but rather let's suppose that we wanted to give them both, at both payoffs on average in every period of more than one, some number more than one, something that's possible to achieve by some combination of escalate and de-escalate playing. Each player plays escalate sometimes and de-escalate sometimes, to include always, on the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium path of play. And the folk theorem, there are many folk theorems, addresses this question. This is a folk theorem, it's like a folk song. It was a theorem that Everybody sort of knew it was true. Uh, there is a paper about it, an important paper by Axel, Axel Rod. I should know this. The poor guy should maybe have his name on the theorem. Uh, but it's a folk theorem, like a folk song, a song, a theorem that, that people know. I got paper reviews back that said, what do they say? Although the main result is almost a folk theorem, I find the result novel and recommend a revision. So that's good. They recommended a revision. They accepted the paper later on. Uh, but wow, almost a folk theorem. People sort of know this. But hey, it's going to get published anyway, just like the other guy's paper. So I'll take it. All right, so here's the statement. So suppose G is a static game of complete information. Here's our example. It could be a different game, but here will be our example. With Nash equilibrium payoffs. We're going to let u1 star and u2 star be the placeholders here. Yuk is going to be our player one. Zook is going to be our player two. With Nash equilibrium payoff, u1 star and u2 star. We said last time, escalate, escalate is the only Nash equilibrium in this game. The payoffs are one to each of them. So u1 star is one. u2 star is one. If u1 and u2 are feasible payoffs of g, this doesn't mean some sort of equilibrium. This doesn't mean uh, any kind of strategic uh, decision making. This just means it could happen. So here are some feasible payoffs. This was our example when we did grim trigger strategies last time. 2, 2, u1 is equal to 2, u2 is equal to 2. These are feasible payoffs. They can happen when both players de-escalate. So it could happen. Your feasible payoffs of G, and U1 is strictly greater than U1 star, and U2 is strictly greater than U2 star. So this fits the bill. 2 is greater than 1. So U1 is greater than U1 star. 2 is greater than 1. So U2 is greater than U2 star. Then there are grim trigger strategies that support average payoffs, u1 and u2. So what does this mean? It means on average, in every period, ignoring the discount factor, player one gets u1, player two gets u2. And a critical discount factor delta, we're gonna use delta with a little line on top, such that those strategies form a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium for all delta, whoops, greater than or equal, to the critical delta. Okay. Last time 
we said, we found for our grim trigger strategies that uh, delta bar, the critical delta, was one half. So today we want to ask ourselves not about a particular set of payoffs, two, two, like last time, but all feasible payoffs. So what we want to do is uh, find a geometric way to describe feasible payoffs. And so the way we're going to do this is we're going to graph the payoffs in each of these four squares uh, on the Cartesian plane. So here we are. This axis is going to be Yook's payoff, or player one's payoff. This axis is going to be Zook's payoff, or player two's payoff. And so over here, the left payoff is Yook's payoff, and the right payoff is Zook's payoff. So the tradition is that the left coordinate gets plotted on the horizontal axis, and the right coordinate gets plotted on the vertical axis. So we're going to plot these points on our graph. This is how we're going to start finding feasible payoffs. So here we go. Here's 1, 1. Now we're, this is escalate, escalate. Now we're going to plot 3, 0. Yook escalates. Zook de-escalates right here. Up here, we're going to plot 0, 3, where Yook de-escalates while Zook escalates. And then up here, we're going to plot 2, 2. This is the payoff where they, this is the payoff where they both de-escalate. So we've plotted all of these coordinates. If we had a larger game, we would have to plot more of these. But we'll stick to this version. And so what do we mean by feasible? Well, what we want to do is connect the dots. We should, in some sense, connect these and these as well, although we're about to get rid of them. All right, so we want to connect all the dots, the four dots that we plotted. We want to connect the dots and then look at the largest region that encloses all of the lines that connect the dots. So here, this is a boundary, this is a boundary, this is a boundary, this is a boundary. These lines, where we connected these dots, these payoffs, are contained inside this larger little kite shape, this larger kite shape. So they're not part of the boundary. So this kite is the largest region that contains all of the connect the dots lines. Let's take these off since we don't need them anymore. All right, so here's our region of feasible payoffs. What does it mean then to be feasible? It looks from our matrix like it's 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 0, and 0, 3. But think back to our discussion of mixed strategies. We're not going to have an equilibrium in mixed strategies per se. We're not. Uh, but think back to mixed strategies where Yook could play not strictly escalate or de-escalate, but could play, say, de-escalate half the time and escalate half the time. And Yook could play, and Zook could play de-escalate a quarter of the time and escalate three quarters of the time. And then that would give some other set of expected payoffs for uh, our players. What would happen? If Yook played escalate half the time and de-escalate half the time, while well, Zook always escalated. So here's Yook. Here's Yook de-escalating. Here's Yook escalating as we go down here. It's going to be somewhere halfway between here. And Zook escalates always. So we're going to be over here in this column half the time. Sorry, I did a bad job on the, on the graph. Half the time, Yook de-escalates and gets 0. Half the time, Yook escalates and gets 1. So Yook gets a half. Um, Zook gets 1 half times 3 plus 1 half times 1 is 2. So we're over here at Zook getting 2 and Yook getting 1 half. All right. So that's feasible. It could happen. 
We aren't saying anything about the strategic sensibility or rationality of that. We're just saying, hey, it could happen. So this region and everything inside of it, these are all of the feasible outcomes of the game. So when we say feasible payoffs of G, what we mean is this kite, this kite and everything in it. So the next thing that we should do is we should locate U1 star and U2 star on our graph. We said here the Nash equilibrium payoffs are 1, 1. This is the only Nash equilibrium in the game. So here it is on our graph. And now we want to ask ourselves about feasible payoffs of G, where both players are strictly better off than they would be in Nash equilibrium. So it's going to be points contained in this kite above U2 star and to the right of U1 star. So up and to the right of this point. So how do we indicate that on our graph? We're going to start at this point. We're going to make a vertical dotted line straight up. Remember, a dotted line means we don't actually include the points on the line. We're going to make a dotted line horizontally straight out. Again, the dots mean that we don't include the points on the line. We're not going to include this point either. It's feasible, but it is the net point of Nash equilibrium payoffs, so it's not feasible payoffs uh, greater than, strictly greater than Nash payoffs. But we need them to be feasible, so they need to still be in this kite. So let's mark all of these points in red. It's going to be this shaded region plus this border. We're going to call this the folk theorem region. not an official term that I've seen in any textbook. Uh, it is the term that my advisor used when I took his game theory course. It makes sense. I feel like if you used it with many economists, especially economists who went to the University of Maryland and took game theory with my former PhD advisor, uh, because we all did, uh, they would know what you were talking about. Uh, so if I say the folk theorem region, this is what we're talking about. If you say it, to, um, to people on the street, not that I'm advising that, but if you say it to, to other economists and they say, what's that, and you draw this little picture, uh, they, I think they should understand you. Note that we didn't say anything about our critical delta. We just know it's out there. The way this theorem is structured, it says there exists, there are. There's that critical delta out there. If you picked some fees at some point, you know, you just picked this one, hey, it's in the folk theorem region, you could go back out some grim trigger strategies and find an appropriate critical delta. We are not going to concern ourselves with that. Uh, we're going to concern ourselves with, given a static game of complete information, finding the appropriate folk theorem region. All right, so this takes us to the end of our discussion of repeated games, and thus to the end of our discussion of dynamic games of complete information.